This podcast is brought to you by the Creation Academy, an apologetics ministry designed to teach, train, and inspire others to become strong defenders of the Christian faith and biblical creation. Launching early 2019, the Academy offers video and audio training with downloadable course workbooks, expert interviews, and exclusive Q&A sessions with leading creation scientists and apologists, quarterly ebooks covering a wide variety of subject matter, and even a private Facebook community where you'll fellowship and interact with a like-minded community of believers. If you want to be notified when the Academy goes live, and even help us design the experience from the ground up, head on over to www.jointca.co today and sign up for the wait list. You'll get early access to the Facebook group for free as a thank you for joining us. Hey everybody, you're listening to The Creation Academy, a weekly podcast defending the truth of God's Word and biblical creation science. I'm your host, Steve Schramm, and this week we want to talk about the case for cosmological redshifts. The case for cosmological redshifts. We're going to draw uh, directly from a paper that um, creationist astronomer Dr. Danny Faulkner uh, published in the Answers Research Journal in March of this year. On the 14th of March in this year, he, he posted uh, this, uh, this, this paper called The Case for Cosmological Redshifts. And if that sounds like a complicated subject, um, don't worry, it is. It is. So if you don't get everything uh, the first time, um, that's why podcasts are great. Just one reason, feel free to Hit the rewind button, go back, listen as many times as you need to uh, in order uh, to get it. And um, who knows, I might have to hit the record button a few times, all right, uh, before I get it. Uh, Because this is a a, a difficult subject. I lay no claim to be a creation scientist nor a creation astronomer of any sort, even an um, amateur um, astronomer. So uh, I, I spent considerable time reading over this paper and, and, and gleaning from it what I could. And, and so I just want to share some important things about it um, with, with, with you today in hopes that we can all come to a better understanding about this uh, subject. And one of the reasons, too, why I, I really liked this paper and wanted to talk with it is because it, Dr. Faulkner takes special time to speak to the issue of um, creationist integrity, all right, and um, and how sometimes creationists tend to downplay even what is clearly empirically verifiable uh, evidence anybody can see, no problem whatsoever, um, that some creationists have trouble accepting, and he spends a a little bit of time um, kind of dealing with that and explaining why he thinks that might be. Now, that these things are scattered all throughout, so we're not going to... We're going to talk about that a little bit here at the, at the outset, some during the middle and then some even at the conclusion. But uh, what what Dr. Faulkner kind of identifies here is this problem of, of creationist integrity and, and, and maybe the fear of of evolutionary implications. And there's a greater problem here. We actually, this was one of the first podcast episodes we recorded. Um, The audio quality would be terrible for you to go back and listen to, but you're welcome to. Uh, I think it was one of the first five episodes, maybe, um, of the show, or or maybe in the first ten. And it it dealt with um, the issue of whenever a new mainstream discovery comes out, the way that we tend to react as young earth creationists. And um, it's really sad that a lot of times, and this was episode 11, okay, I'm looking at that now, all right, this was episode um, number uh, 11, lesson 11, why creationists should be excited about new mainstream 
discoveries. And I will go ahead and, and put a link to that in the show notes as well so it's easy to get to. But, um, you know, we, we, we talked about um, during that lesson the fact that we can be excited about new discoveries. We can be um, excited about somebody finds a, a, a new fossil in the ground or somebody finds a new planet, uh, even if they think that it is... Um, uh, inhabitable for some reason. Uh, w- w- these discoveries are not something that should shake our faith. Now, I realize that that sounds like, you know, a little bit, oh, I-, I don't know the word I'm looking for, maybe a little bit far-fetched. Uh, like, it sounds like, it sounds like it would be a reasonable expectation to have our faith shaken by some of these new discoveries. Uh, So I guess maybe that's what I'm saying. Maybe what I'm telling you might seem a little bit counterintuitive from an evidential perspective. And that's, uh, you know, verses like uh, where Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians, if Christ be not raised, then your faith is in vain. You're yet in your sins. So that seems to suggest at the face of it that if if Christ had been ra- or hadn't been raised, sure enough, uh, if there was a way to empirically verify that, that uh, Christianity would be vain. And that's exactly right. He's exactly right about that. But see, you see, here's the thing. We have no reason whatsoever to believe that Jesus Christ was not raised from the dead. We have no reason to believe that whatsoever. Um, and when we see these new uh, discoveries, we already know we have a true worldview, especially if we're operating, um, as I believe we should, at looking at the Bible from a presuppositional perspective, because it's the only, um, Christianity is the only worldview that can make sense of our actual experience. Um, and we'll talk about that maybe another time, but um, the point is we have every reason to believe that Christianity is true and no reason to believe that it's not. And that being the case, we shouldn't... Um, fear new discoveries, even by mainstream scientists. We should welcome and be excited about these things. I want to give you a quote from Dr. Todd Wood. I hadn't planned on doing this, but as I, as I pulled up this lesson, um, lesson 11, I, I remembered this quote, and I want to uh, bring it to you because it's such a such a good, rich quote directly from his blog, Dr. Dr. Todd Wood, and he said this, I can be excited about new fossils because I have confidence in God, the Creator. At the end of the day, even if a new fossil upends my old way of thinking, God is still creator. That faith liberates me from the anxiety and worry that seems to plague some Christians when new fossils are announced. My God is the God who called the universe into existence and led his people into a promised land and saved my soul. Death itself could not keep him in the grave And some old dead fossils are not going to change any of that. At the end of the day, I am an explorer. I stand on the edge of an amazing frontier. Every new fossil discovery is another corner of that frontier opened up. Every new genome sequenced is a map to parts hitherto unknown. I say, we have nothing to fear. I say, let's go explore. And I say, amen. Um, I love that quote from Dr. Wood. I think he's so genuine and so rich um, and really uh, genuinely believes um, what he says. And I believe it too. I think that we have every reason to think that any new discovery, any new observation, it has a place in God's world and in God's universe because that is the universe in which we live. So I'm not worried, and get what I'm saying here, I'm not worried in fear about the evolutionary implications of some new discovery that is made. Now, it's not because I'm ignorant. It's not because I'm a science denier. All right? It, 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 it's not because um, I think that all scientists are liars. It, it's none of the above. It's none of those things. It's just that I realize and I get that data has to be interpreted. And the only time evolutionary implications come in is when there are false interpretations. That's the only time. 
when the interpretation of the data is bad. Any piece of data can be interpreted using the philosophical bias that Christians prefer over the philosophical bias that naturalists, um, for example, prefer. And it doesn't uh, to to say that you interpret scientific data apart from a philosophical bias would be a terrible lie it would be a terrible lie that's part of the method method, method methodological naturalism excuse me along with philosophical naturalism dominate the sciences they dominate the sciences but there is no rule that says you know thou shalt interpret science based on philosophical naturalism I see no reason whatsoever not to interpret science through the lens of Christian theism, and that's all we do. All right, and we talked about that a little bit um, in our in our uh, mini series a few weeks back on uh, creationism and pseudoscience. So um, I just want you to really uh, I want to encourage you, I guess, this morning um, thinking about that. I want to encourage you that we don't have to fear any time these new discoveries take place or we find something that's a little puzzling to us at first because it just is a, a, a fact of false interpretations. It has nothing to do with an actual problem for our view. Faulkner says this, actually. He says, rejection of, and he's speaking to the specific issue at hand here now, he says, rejection of cosmological redshifts could stifle development of a true biblical cosmology. Now, that's quite a statement. It could stifle um, development of a true biblical cosmology. And so let me begin to give you just a little bit of of a background here, and we're going to get right into it. If you don't know at all what we're talking about, I mean, this is ground level here. There is a um, quote-unquote problem called the light time travel problem the light travel time problem, heard it said both ways. And um, the popular understanding of this problem is essentially that we live in a universe that uh, scientists, uh, some of the best scientists today, think is about 13.8 billion years old. And not all, but much of the reason they think this is the case is because of the distance... um, and the time that it would take to travel to uh, the the far reaches of the universe. In other words, when light is observed uh, by us here on Earth, or either very close to the Earth, we're seeing this light, um, depending on what we're looking at, late. We're seeing it minutes late. We're seeing it thousands of years late. We're seeing it even millions of years even billions of years late. So, um, this is a phenomenon also called deep time. Deep time is the idea that this universe has been here for 13.8 billion years, and we can't even understand. I mean, our minds can't even comprehend that, and that's that's kind of part of the mysticism around it. You know, they say uh, they they say, well, you know, it's this is a hard concept for you to grasp because it it it, it just seems ungraspable. Your 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 mind cannot comprehend what that much time really looks and feels like. Well, I agree. I have a hard time grasping 6,000 years, uh, but I believe that's the the true age of the Earth and and the universe. And so what happens is a lot of, in the past especially, a lot of recent creationists have looked at the astronomical uh, data presented by the best astronomers and astrophysicists in the world, and these guys are claiming that uh, because of the fact that it would take you know, millions of light years to to travel to a particular destination in the universe, then that is an indicator of uh, of look back time. They call it, and the problem, of course, with this is that in one sense it assumes what it's trying to prove. It 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 is a in one sense a confirmation of the popular Big Bang model, in another sense, it assumes what it's trying to prove because um, if there is not 
uh, millions and billions of years to be looking at, then it's obvious that that's not what we're seeing. We're actually seeing something else. And now this kind of gets us to the problem. When, when we look at cosmological redshifts, what we end up doing is, and, and if we have this bias towards it and, and we remain skeptical of it, we end up rejecting what is really some beautiful and seemingly accurate observable science. And it, people, you know, might try to make the distinction here and say that this is a sort of origin science or a sort of historical science, but friends, it's not. This is observable, operational science, whatever word you like to use. I don't, myself, I don't care to make those distinctions. I tend to think of origins as more of a ph philosophical thing, typically, uh, but that's another discussion for another time. What I want to point out to you is that we're talking about a denial of observable science. And this is a problem. We do not have to deny, and we should not deny, observable science in order to make our points. This um, has a lot to do with the credibility of creationists. And I applaud Dr. Danny Faulkner for taking this step because it's important as committed recent creationists that we play fair with the data and accept those things that are good matters of observational science that are not clouded um, necessarily. That's an important distinction. They're not necessarily clouded by false interpretations. Now, many people will apply false interpretations to that data, but the data does not require the interpretation. And now that's the important point to understand. Okay, so basically what he's talking about here is the fact that if you reject this phenomenon of a, of, of a cosmological redshift for fear of the evolutionary implications, um, then you've got an even bigger problem because it appears that you would have to advocate for, or at least you would have to think that you are advocating for, an eternal universe. But the best advocates, as we're going to find out, for, the, for, for an eternal universe, the steady state theory, um, uh, ultimately still had this problem to deal with. And so that's what we're going to talk about. So we're going to look at three um, pieces of evidence here that should help us to, to, to clear up and build a little bit of a case for uh, accepting cosmological redshifts as, um, as young earth creationists or young, young age creationists. And the three things we're going to look at are evidence for what's called the Hubble uh, relation, the Hubble relation. And then we're going to look at evidence for the expansion of the universe and then we're going to look at evidence for cosmological quasars, cosmological quasars. Okay, so we're going to look at those things and um, try to see if we can determine what uh, what we should do, how we, how we should respond to these things. Now, this article is out there on, uh, again, the Answers Research Journal. I will um, link link to that as well uh, to make sure that you uh, you have access to that so you can read it if you want to it's a long read it's a good read I've taken most of it and I've given you know put a lot of quotes in here in my show notes and um, so I'm going to try to get through as much of this as I can uh, and hopefully get it across in such a way that you understand it and and we all have a little bit better understanding of this. So um, uh, he begins here, um, Edwin Hubble, uh, who um, uh, around 1929 is credited with the discovery of the expansion of the universe. Now, technically, um, what, Hubble, what Hubble found is the Hubble relation, a linear relationship between galaxy, redshift, and distance. Now, um, this number is noted in the scientific literature as Z. So we're going to talk about that as we go through. And anytime we say Z, notice that what we're talking about is a relationship that can be plotted. All right. It's linear. It can be plotted uh, between galaxy redshift and distance. So this means, just to be very um, broad, all right, this means that when there is a shift in the color spectrum, 
All right. Positive Z is a red shift. Negative Z is a blue shift. When we observe this phenomenon happening in the distant cosmos, we see other galaxies. We see that they are red shifted on the scale. All right. One, um, one side or to one side or the other. It is a indicator of the distance away that this particular galaxy or or object is from the point of the observer. This is basically what the Hubble relation is. All right, now, um, when we look at a difference now between what is called Doppler motions and a cosmological redshift, we have to consider a few factors. So, because these are... Um, these are both phenomena that will pre produce a redshift when we're looking at the at the data, and we need to be able to distinguish which one we are seeing in order to get an accurate indication of the distance away. All right. Now, uh, for Doppler motions, um, Faulkner says that redshifts of extragalactic objects are the sum of two distinct effects: one local and one global. Now, the gravity of local objects accelerate galaxies so that they move with respect to space. For simplicity, we call this Doppler motion because the component of this motion in our line of sight is measured via the Doppler effect. All right. Now, of course, we know um, what the Doppler effect is, right? It's, it's you know, when you're standing somewhere and you see a train coming and as the train uh, gets closer to you, uh, the the sound uh, gets louder and the closer it gets, the closer it sounds. And the further away it gets, the further away it sounds. This is pretty standard stuff. Um, and so that is what is meant by the Doppler uh, effect. And it's the same kind of thing except with, kind of spectral wavelength, so it's a little different, but it's the same kind of thing when we are looking at these objects. Um, now, by the way, just so you know, because this word is going to come up, I like to define words that maybe are a little bit unclear for people as we're going through this, but the word extra galactic simply means outside of the Milky Way. Outside of the Milky Way, when, when astronomers refer to extra galactic um, objects or whatever, they are generally meaning that it's outside of our um, galaxy, okay? So that is Doppler motions. This is one effect, and it has to do with the gravity um, of of the objects themselves, and they move uh, with respect to space. These objects move themselves. So this is all Doppler motion is talking about. But then on the other hand, we have these cosmological redshifts. All right, now this Hubble relation that we talked about seems to suggest an expanding universe. And we are going to dig more into that here in just a minute about the expanding universe um, idea. All right, now Faulkner says the prediction is that if the universe is expanding, then redshift will increase with increasing distance. On the other hand, if it is contracting, redshift will decrease with increasing distance. This is reasonable. Since the Hubble relation confirms the former, it appears that the universe is expanding. So with increasing distance, the redshift number increases, and this was a prediction, and that's what we found. So um, the universe appears to be expanding. Now it can be given uh, that redshift due to expansion may be given as this equation, z equals a to the zero over a minus one where a to the zero is uh, current scale factor of the universe, and a is the scale factor at the time when light we are now receiving from distant objects was emitted. The scale factor is a function of time. Since this redshift is due to an effect of cosmology, we say that redshifts of this nature are cosmological. So... So far, this isn't too difficult to understand. We have um, two kinds of phenomena that can produce these redshifts. One is more local, and the other is cosmological and indicates great distance, great distance. Um, observationally, it is impossible 
to distinguish between Doppler motion and cosmological redshift. Therefore, it is not possible to determine how much of an extragalactic object's redshift is due to cosmic expansion and how much is due to Doppler motion. Undoubtedly, the redshift of nearby galaxies is dominated by Doppler motion, while the redshifts of distant galaxies are dominated by cosmic expansion. At sufficient distance, Doppler motion is so modest as compared to cosmic expansion that it is negligible. So do you see what happens What happens there? Just to make sure you're understanding this. Um, while you cannot tell the difference between the two at face value, um, observationally just looking at it, it seems reasonable to suggest that when you get into these extragalactic objects and you start looking at very um, um, distant objects, the redshift in them is greater, and so it increases with distance. So um, it it very much seems reasonable then to say that the uh, Doppler motion becomes just I mean, almost negligible in comparison to ones that are produced as a result of cosmic expansion. Now, some have questioned whether the universe was actually expanding, and therefore, whether redshifts were Doppler or cosmological. Now, in the creationist community, some doubt remains. And really, you know, this is the crux of the problem. We have to really be careful denying um, things like the expansion of the universe that are so observationally confirmed. And again, we're going to talk more about that in just a minute. Now, there appears to be confusion, according to Faulkner, uh, among recent creationists on three important questions. One, is the universe expanding? Two, do galaxy redshifts indicate distance? And then three, do quasar redshifts indicate distance? And he says that most astronomers would answer all three of these questions in the affirmative. However, many recent creationists would answer one or more in the negative. Now, what Faulkner is really wanting to argue here is that creationists, while most accept number one, although not all, he's going to argue here that creationists should be comfortable accepting all three of these. And why is that? It's because they are observationally sound, observationally valid. Now, I don't want to give away too many spoilers here, but some of the things that we're going to discuss in this paper, there is no good creationist interpretation for yet. Now, don't let that scare you. Again, don't let that scare you. Do you have any idea how little research funding, and I don't want to get on a hobby horse here, okay, but do you have any idea how little research and funding there is for creation science in comparison to mainstream science, creation science as an endeavor since only really the 60s. I mean, some before that, but the real movement began around the 60s with Dr. Morris and their work as far as popularizing him, all right? Now, just think practically about this. Isn't it amazing what all we do know from a creationist uh, perspective and what all interpretations we can place on the observational data for what we have. I mean, this is an optimistic thing to me. The f it doesn't bother me that we have things that we have not had the resources yet to explain. By the way, creation astronomers are few and far between. At least those who have come out publicly about it, about the fact that they're creationists, Astronomy is a field who needs more creation scientists, and we need this. We need this, and astrophysicists as well. We've got to have this um, to be able to do this 
kind of work. So we're going to talk about some things that have not been given a good creationist interpretation yet, but that's okay because every piece of data before there was an in, that, that we have one for now um, used to not have a good interpretation. We used to not have a good interpretation of fossils. We used to not have a good understanding and interpretation of the genome, and we're still working on that from a creationist perspective, but we're making leaps and bounds of speciation, right? Of um, uh, of understanding uh, the uh, stratigraphy and the different layers um, for the, uh, you know, interpreting for the flood versus interpreting for millions of years as mainstream science does. So all of these things at one point were without interpretation. And now we do have good interpretations for them. So I want to give you confidence and courage as we look at this issue that um, there are good answers to these questions and for some of these questions, there are no good answers. But that doesn't mean we don't keep exploring. Just like Dr. Wood said that I quoted a little while ago. All right, let's look then at evidence for the expansion of the universe. Now, Faulkner says here that the expanding universe was a prediction of general relativity, one of the most tested theories of physics. He says, I find it interesting that some recent creationists who appear to accept general relativity reject this prediction of that theory. We need to talk about h to the zero real quick, h to the zero power real quick. We talked about that, mentioned it a minute ago, but it is called the Hubble constant. And it is uh, essentially the slope of the Hubble relation when plotted. Now, the most straightforward interpretation, according to, to Dr. Faulkner here, is of the Hubble relation that the universe is expanding. If this is true, then h to the zero essentially measures the expansion rate. Now, today, he says, the best estimate of h to the zero is about 70 kilometers um, per second per megaparsec. Now, a parsec is about 3.3 light years, and a megaparsec is one million of those. All right, we'll talk about that a few times here. We'll mention that, so I just want you to know what that is. So, we're talking about a speed of 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. This is quick. All right, this is very quick. The um, two current um, major determinations of the Hubble constant are 73 plus or minus 2 kilometers per second per megaparsec uh, from um, CFID variables and type IA supernova and 66.9 plus or minus 0.6 kilometers per second per megaparsec inferred from the cosmic microwave background uh, radiation or the CMB. Now, we gave you a, a lot of uh, terms there. If you're not familiar with um, with astronomy, then um, some of them might be a little vague to you. Um, just real quick, CFID variables and type IA supernovas, these are a couple um, standard candles, they're called. And basically these are special types of uh, stars that um, have properties that allow us to gain an understanding of how far away they are um, based on certain properties that they um, have. So uh, there's that. And then there is the, this cosmic microwave background radiation. Now this one has always been a thorn in the creationist um, uh, side because what's interesting, what's interesting here is that mainstream scientists tend to say that um, whenever this cosmic microwave background radiation was discovered, it ended up being, it was a, it was a prediction. The Big Bang Theory supposedly predicted this, and then um, it turned out to be true. But that's actually not the case. The cosmic background radiation was actually discovered before the Big Bang Theory was put in place as the um, current scientific method. Actually, the Big Bang was developed to help explain it, if you look at the actual history on that. So I encourage you to research that sometime, but that's not the point of today. So this, uh, using these um, uh, CFID variables, type A, supernova, um, the cosmic micro microwave background um, um, radiation, we can get an idea of 
the Hubble constant, in other words, the rate that the universe is expanding. Um, trigonomic parallax is the only direct method of measuring stellar di um, distances, and it's far too limited in range to be of use in determining extragalactic distances. So um, astronomers use these standard candles as indirect methods to measure the distances of galaxies. And we mentioned this a minute ago, but the best known standard candle is CFID variables. And again, I don't want to get all into what, what those are, but essentially there's like a six-day time period in which CFID variables, um, they're, the light that is emitted from them appears to vary. And it has to do with the chemical composition and gravity. There are a lot of factors in there. Uh, but because of the properties of these variables, uh, variable stars, we are able to use them in determining these distances. Now, there's a, a problem or two with measuring redshift. Um, if the universe is expanding, then the observed redshift is the sum of its cosmological redshift or Hubble flow caused by expansion of the universe and the galaxy's Doppler motion due to local effects of gravity. Now, while the Hubble flow component is always positive, the Doppler effect can actually be positive or negative. So furthermore, um, while Hubble flow increases linearly with distance, Doppler motion ought to fluctuate positively and negatively around an average value of zero for any given space or any given region of space. Now, the result is that um, the redshifts of nearby galaxies are dominated by Doppler motion, but the redshifts of distant galaxies are dominated by Hubble flow. Observationally, they're indistinguishable, and there's just no way to determine what portion of a galaxy's redshift is due to the Hubble flow and what portion is due to Doppler motion. And in the paper, Dr. Faulkner gives the Andromeda Galaxy, M31, has a good example of, of the difficulty in determining this. Now, because of these difficulties um, in, a, in finding a way to reliable reliably measure these things, the um, proper value of the of the um, Hubble constant can only be measured by a type IA supernova, a rare astronomical event. However, Faulkner points out that advances in computer technology have made the type IA supernova method of finding extragalactic distances feasible. Robotic telescopes of the intermediate size routinely take images of thousands of galaxies every night when calibration images are automatically subtracted out and the remaining objects are supernovae. These um, detections trigger alerts to much larger telescopes that can further investigate whether the supernova um, detected are type IA, measuring the maximum, uh, excuse me, measure the maximum brightness of any candidates and measure the red shifts of the host galaxies. Over the past 25 years, this method has been employed to find red shifts and distances, uh, excuse me, and distances of many galaxies over a broad range of distances and red shifts. Nearly all these measurements are beyond the limit that Doppler components are significant. So the observed red shifts are almost entirely Hubble flow. Therefore, the Hubble relation based upon type IA supernova is very robust. This work has been the major method of determining the currently accepted value of H to the zero being a little more than 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Now, it's my contention here, and along with Faulkner's, that since these observations so clearly imply an expanding universe and, and, and so seem to confirm this, um, this should be accepted universally by young age creationists. I really don't think there should be any controversy here. And Faulkner gives us this warning. He says, opposition to an expanding universe appears to be motivated by an opposition to the Big Bang model. Obviously, if the universe is not expanding, then the Big Bang could not have happened. However, the Big Bang model is not the only possible cosmology or cosmogony based upon an expanding universe. For instance, the eternal steady state model was also based upon an expanding universe. What if the universe is expanding? If so, then the rejection of that concept would make it impossible to develop a biblical cosmological model. And hopefully you can see what the terrible implications of that would be. I need to correct something here. As I'm, as I'm looking at this, I'm realizing that I have been reading... Um, 
this as uh, when I say supernova, I've been saying type IA. It's a type 1A supernova, all right? Type 1A. And I will try to get that right going forward. Um, as I look at that, I'm thinking, well, I'm not reading that right. So it, I'm not an astronomer. I told you that. But I guess I can at least get my terms right. Um, you have every right to expect that of me. So I'm sorry about that. Make that correction. Um, a type 1A supernova, not IA. I'm not sure why I read it that way, all right? Um, so continuing on then, so we have good evidence to suggest that there is an expanding universe. But now, what about cosmological quasars? Is there any evidence for cosmological quasars? Now, a quasar or a QSO, um, it's simply a quasi-stellar object. That's what that means. And there is a um, suggestion in here that many recent creationists have kind of latched on to that's a little bit troubling. Um, I have myself have looked into it a little bit, and uh, knowing what I know now, I think we should be careful to consider these things. Um, the two overarching models, to give you a little bit of background, you know, in the past century... Uh, really have been the Big Bang Theory and the Steady State Theory. Of course, the um, Big Bang Theory is the one that is most um, widely regarded today as the proper cosmological model for the universe as we observe it. And the Steady State Theory um, was... Uh, pretty much put to bed by some of the observations, really, that we're talking about today. Um, especially some of the observations that we're getting ready to see as it result, uh, or as it uh, relates to cosmological quasars. And um, the Big Bang model is the model that would suggest that there was a, <clears throat> excuse me, a point in time when the universe had a beginning, and the steady state model was based on an eternal universe. However, um, the expansion of the universe was still a um, a factor in within the steady state model. And to me, this was just another thing that you know would eventually seal its fate. Um, if you know anything philosophically speaking about um, eternal. Uh, sets and infinite sets and things like that, you realize that transversing an infinite is is impossible. Um, the whole idea of an infinite universe is just impossible by scientific standards such as the law of um, the laws of thermodynamics, philosophical standards such as the fact that you can't transverse an actual infinite and all kinds of things. So uh, for many, many good reasons, the steady state theory has pretty much been put to to bed. Unfortunately, many recent creationists tend to accept parts of this theory, all seemingly without realizing the implications that it has on the kind of data that we need to be accepting in order to have a, a proper bi biblical cosmology. Um, now, these uh, quasi-stellar objects, or quasars, are a problem for steady-state theory. And Faulkner explains that there are no low-redshift quasars, which, if they are cosmological, suggests that quasars do not exist locally. Now, within four years of their discovery, it was shown that the density of quasars increases with increasing distance. Now, this suggests that quasars were abundant in the past, but are relatively rare today, implying that the universe has a history. Ergo, uh, the existence of quasars, if their redshifts are cosmological, disproves the steady state theory. It's no wonder that the hardest or harshest cri uh, critics of redshifts of quasars being cosmological, for example, Halt and Arp, uh, Burbage and Hoyle, were also proponents of the steady state model. And he continues on here that some recent creationists expressed doubt about reality of the Hubble relation and cosmological redshifts while simultaneously embracing the galactocentric implications of quantized redshifts without realizing the inherent contradiction of these two positions. Much of this discussion of redshifts in the creation literature centers on the nature of quasars. And I myself have read a lot of these papers um, 
over the years, and I think he's right about that. It, it, we seem to be grasping at the quasar straw here to try to to try to make quasars explain more than they are able to explain. If I were just to boil it all down, um, the argument is usually something of getting uh, helping us to see that when we observe redshift in the cosmos, that we're what we are observing is um, the redshift emitted by these quasars. And that they are a result of local phenomena, not of cosmological expansion, that kind of thing. Now, Halt and Arp was key to this discussion, all right? And he uh, he died recently, very recently. In the la- I mean, in this century, um, in this, uh, um, you know, last few years, all right? Now, a major part of Arp's argument against cosmological redshifts was the identification of pairs of objects that form optical images that appear to be connected by matter yet have discordant redshifts. If a pair of objects are truly connected, then they must be at the same distance. But if redshifts are cosmological, then the discordant redshifts of the pair indicate radically different distances. Hence, if one can establish even one unequivocal uh, unequivocal interacting pair of extragalactic objects with discordant redshifts, then the cosmological interpretation of redshifts is in doubt. The best known example of this is the spiral galaxy NGC 4319 and the Seyfert-like object Markian, uh, Markarian excuse me, 205. This pair is so important, a highly processed image of the two graces the dust jacket of ARP's 1987 book. Now, Essentially, what he's talking about here is looking at two objects, observing the redshift of these two objects, the redshift giving discordant um, seeming distances, except that these two objects appear in optical images to be connected by a, a luminous bridge of some sort. Right? In other words, these two... Objects are connected and yet have different redshift values. And obviously, if that turns out to be the case, um, then there's good reason to call into question the idea that we can that, that the redshifts that we're observing um, are a uh, cosmological thing and therefore an indicator of great distance. Now, new imaging systems have come along since that time, though that use the old photographic plate system, all right? But now new imaging systems have come out, even such as the Hubble Space Telescope, and they have shed better light on the images in question. And uh, in these images, there seems to be no luminous bridge present. If quasars are not extremely luminous objects at great distances, Faulkner asks, then what does Harp suggest they are? He proposed that relatively nearby galaxies eject quasars from their cores. But there's a problem. There's a problem with that. See, if there were no absorption from gas in the galaxy in the spectrum of the quasar, that would be evidence for ARP's contention. But get this. If there is no absor- absor- if there is no, uh, or excuse me, if there is absorption, then that can be explained by ARP's contention too. So therefore... ARP's contention can account for evidence either way. That is, his hypothesis makes no testable prediction in this matter. The conventional understanding that um, qua- that a quasar is a background object makes a very specific prediction that was tested and it passed that test. ARP and his supporters have set up a test that is meaningless about their theory because it can pass the test either way. They tried to determine this based on the statistical probability then also uh, that quasars are found by galaxies, but again, they stacked the deck. Faulkner writes here that Arp and his colleagues first found the distribution of the quasars and galaxies in the sky and then asked what the probability of this happening by chance was. Since the distribution happened, its probability was 1. The probabilities they cite make sense only if one asks the probability of a given distribution prior to finding 
the distribution. You understand what he's trying to say there. This, to me, this it might not be perfectly analogous, but in my mind, this um, is a similar thing as to what happens when somebody commits the logical fallacy of a relevant thesis. Um, you know, you're in a plane crash, and the reporter asks you, how did you survive that plane crash? And you say something like this, I don't know, but if I wasn't here to tell you about it, I wouldn't have survived. Well, that's obvious. It's a true statement, but it has nothing to do with the thing in in question. It's it's just simply irrelevant because it had already um, happened. And so it's the same way like this with this probability uh, problem. If something has already happened, you can't go back and say that the probability of this happening was yada, 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 because the probability of it happening was one. It happened. No problem whatsoever. Now, applying this reasoning to the distribution of quasars and galaxies in the sky, each distribution one finds, those with a close clumping of quasars around galaxies and those that are not uh, clumped are equally improbable. Arp and his colleagues have unintentionally biased their searches toward finding clumping of quasars with galaxies. This amounts to cherry-picking data. Uh, but there's even more. There's these Lyman Alpha forests. Lyman Alpha forests. One of the major arguments for quasar redshift being cosmological is the Lyman um, Alpha forest in the spectra of many quasars. Now, this Lyman Alpha absorption arises from the transition of electrons between the ground state and the first excited state in hydrogen atoms. Its rest wavelength is uh, 121.6 nanometers, which is deep in the ultraviolet. To see Lyman alpha absorption requires two things. Number one, a more distant, bright, ultraviolet continuum source. And two, nearer clouds of cool hydrogen atoms along the line of sight to the continuum source. And Faulkner says this is what we consistently see. Lyman alpha absorption always is redshifted less than the Lyman alpha emission of the quasar. This is a key point because the absorption is possible only if the absorbing regions are closer than the source of the continuum, which is also Kirchhoff's third law of spectroscopy. And this is a powerful argument that the Hubble relation holds for all sorts of extragalactic, um, extragalactic objects over a wide range of redshifts. So multiple lines of evidence here and much more. I, I, I'm telling you, we're only scratching the surface. There's so much more present in this paper. I mean, you just need to read it. It's great. Read it. Take time to understand it. But these are all very, very good pieces of evidence suggesting that redshifts are indeed cosmological and quasar redshifts are cosmological. Now, as a bit of discussion here, Faulkner asks, given the strong case for redshifts, including those of quasars um, being cosmological, why do so many recent creationists resist it? He gives four possible reasons, uh, the first of which amounts to ignorance. Is it just ignorance of the data that is in place? Do we just, uh, is, it, is it willful ignorance, intentional ignorance, or is it you know, accidental ignorance. What is it? Is it ignorance to the recent discoveries and the recent work that is um, that has been placed in the mainstream literature? Is it this herd mentality? Is it that this idea that we have to be against the grain? We have to go against the grain of these mainstream discoveries. Is it uh, along those lines? Thirdly, is it skepticism of mainstream scientists? And Faulkner says here that one must be careful that healthy skepticism does not give way to an attitude to, and I love Dr. Faulkner's humor here, he says in the words of Yosemite Sam, if it he's for it, then I'm against it. Such a knee-jerk reaction can result in rejecting concepts that are correct and even useful in developing a creation model. Instead, claims and discoveries must be evaluated carefully and responded to effectively. And I totally agree. I mean, we need to evaluate the merit of a claim on its own. If there's good observational data for something, then we accept that and interpret it within our philosophical system, within our world view. The fourth possible reason is just to undermine the Big Bang. Well, in many cases, I'm sure it is, but 
we don't undermine the Big Bang by by not accepting good observational science. That's not a good way to do it. We don't agree with the Big Bang, but we have good reasons for that that don't require the rejection of widely accepted concepts that uh, that there's just no reason to to reject. And again, the Big Bang is not the only available interpretation of the data as it stands. Now he reiterates some of these questions. Um, is the universe expanding? And he says here that general relativity predicted that um, in the general case that universe that the universe was either expanding or contracting, and it was just a matter of observation to determine um, which possibility was the correct description of the universe. He says denial of the expansion of the universe um, interpretation um, of the Hubble relation amounts to a denial of general relativity. And this is profound because some recent creationists who doubt that the universe is expanding appear to have no problem with general relativity. And then he asks, is there a linear relationship between galaxy redshift and distance? The resounding answer is yes. Since Hubble's pioneering work nearly a century ago, astronomers have greatly improved and extended the Hubble relation. The Hubble relation is very robust. And then finally, are quasar redshifts cosmological? A half century ago, quasars and galaxies appeared to be distinct things. However, astronomers soon began to suspect that uh, quasars might be caused by unusually strong activity in the cores of galaxies, usually interpreted as galaxies in their infancy. This suspicion eventually was confirmed as deeper photographs revealed that many quasars are surrounded by light fuzz consistent with that interpretation. A unified theory of supermassive black holes, which is another area, by the way, that we didn't dive into at all, that he spends a lot of time on in the paper, um, a, this unified theory of supermassive back, black holes began to emerge to explain not only quasars, but also unusual galaxies such as those with AGNs, or um, active galactic nuclei. This model has been very successful. Furthermore, the discovery of supermassive black holes in the cores of otherwise unremarkable galaxies has undermined the concept of normal galaxies, as that term was understood a half century ago. It now appears that the distinction between quasars and so-called normal galaxies is artificial, representing the extremes of galaxies possessing the most energetic and least energetic cores. This important development went by almost without comment from ARP, who continued to concentrate on quasars as if they were objects distinct from galaxies. This has passed the notice of most recent creationists as well. So, According to Faulkner, we are urged to accept each one of these questions, to answer them yes in the affirmative. The universe is expanding. Um, there is a linear relationship between galaxy redshift and distance. The Hubble relation is true. Uh, quasar redshifts do appear to be cosmological and not just due to local phenomena of Doppler motion. In conclusion, Faulkner gives a couple helpful things. He says, first, that the Hubble relation is well supported by much observational data, so outright dismissal of this is not an option. The expansion of the universe is an interpretation of, Hub of the Hubble relation, but it appears to be the only viable interpretation, and rejection of that interpretation amounts to a rejection of general relativity, one of the most successfully tested theories in the history of science. If the universe is expanding, then it follows that the redshifts of extragalactic objects, including quasars, are cosmological. And then finally, within a Big Bang model with distance corresponding to look-back time, this trend is explained by galaxy evolution. Now, here's the rub. Since recent creationists reject the Big Bang model in a time scale of billions of years, how do we properly interpret quasars? The answer to that question is not obvious. The answer will likely be related to how one answers the light travel time problem.
If recent creationists continue to argue against cosmological redshifts or quasars, it's unlikely that a satisfactory understanding of quasars will come about. Furthermore, it's unlikely that we can develop a correct cosmology. And so then let me just leave you with this uh, this week. You know, I mean, we need to be careful, very careful, that we are accepting things that we have no good reasons to reject. And part of what Dr. Faulkner argues here that we weren't really able to go into was just this idea that latching on to ARP's ideas in order to try to correct this problem really do not end up correcting the problem at all. And we talked about a little bit about some of the ways that his testing methods um, were not viable. And I, I have respect for ARP. I mean, I've read some of the work. I, 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 he certainly seemed to be a bright guy. But I think he was too attached to this steady state model. And as a result, was not really able to look at this data um, um, as objectively as maybe he ought to have been able to. And I think that his interpretations um, are indicative of, of that. Thank you for, for listening this week. Let's go ahead and, uh, and and say a word of prayer here. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, and we want to say thank you for giving us your word, giving us your world. Thank you that you created uh, this universe. <laughs> I, I love uh, reading through Genesis 1. You know, we make such a big deal about astronomy and astrophysics, and this is so complicated. It's so complex. There's so much to it. There are so many layers to it. And we could go for years and years and years and centuries and millennia and not understand hardly the slightest things about space. And yet, your word covers it in one short phrase. And he made the stars also. What a testament to the magnificence of God. That something that is so almost unfathomable to us for its great size and grandeur was so small for you. And that is such a comfort. That should be such a comfort to us as we go through this life, trying to make sense of, of this life and what it means to serve you and to get to know you, Father. We just bow before you and we want to say thank you for revealing yourself to us and for giving us the ability to study and to learn more about you. Thank you so much for each and every one of my listeners. I pray, Lord, that you would just give us a good week, that you would help us, Lord, to be strong defenders of the faith and of your word and of you, Father. Help us to handle conversations rightly, Lord, and help us to always rest in the truth of your revealed word above what anybody says. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, I want to thank you again for joining me this week on the Creation Academy, a little bit different episode this time, looking at this um, um, idea of, of, of reading a paper and, and getting some of the ideas out of it. I hope you liked it. Um, I do plan to do this again in, in the future, uh, getting some information um, out of a scientific paper and trying to relate it to you maybe in an understandable way. In the future, I may try to find a way to do it that depends a little bit less on using so much of the paper's material. Maybe I could I could spread out the research a little bit to a few different sources. Um, anyway, I'll work on that, but um, in the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this one uh, for this week and want to just say thank you so much for joining us again on the Creation Academy. Hey, look, if I could ask you one favor, um, would you mind going to uh, in your iTunes podcast directory and just leaving a review? Just leave a review. If you have any questions on how to do that, you could certainly reach out to me. Uh, but I would love for you to go leave a five-star review if you found that this content was helpful. Um, the reason is it helps us to get found. It helps other people to find our podcast. Now, there's not that many creation science podcasts out there, especially not many um, active ones. So... Um, but right now we have absolutely no reviews, not one person, um, and 
you know, I'm not mad. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm grateful that even one person would would take the time to listen. And the, the fact of the matter is that many of you listen. Um, so I'm thankful for that. But would one of you just consider going and leaving a review if you found this helpful? Um, it does. Um, um, move uh, the algorithms and such it does move our names up a little bit all right in the podcast directory so other people have an easier time finding us and then when people do find us uh your review will help them to know if this is the kind of information and the kind of podcast that will be helpful for them so would you do that for me just go into the itunes podcast directory and leave it a review giving us a five star rating if you want to for our podcast that would be Uh, an absolute blessing. All right, friends, thank you for joining us this week on the Creation Academy, and we will see you next week. Thanks, and bye-bye.